Why won't it be the Ravens winning the AFC North this season? Find out here on the 2024 Locked On NFL Season Previews, continuing on the AFC North right now. This is the 2024 Locked On NFL Season Preview, only on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the 2024 Locked On NFL Season Previews. This episode, we are focused on the AFC North. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. I'm Christopher Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers podcast, and I'm your host for this divisional preview. Joining me are my colleagues from the Locked On Podcast Network, including Kevin Ostriker of Locked On Ravens, Jake Liskow of Locked On Bengals, and Jeff Lloyd of Locked On Browns. Today, we are going to look at the contenders, what makes a successful season for them, any early host seats, what, what one thing could derail each of their team seasons, win totals, MVP candidates, and of course, predictions of where each of these teams will finish. Let's start with the end, though. We'll talk about the end of last year. We stick with the reigning division champions, that was the Ravens. So we go to Kevin. Kevin, where have the Ravens improved or stayed still to get ready for this season? And what is their outlook to as a chance of repeating as division champs? Yeah, I think they do have a shot to repeat this season. And part of that is because they are bringing back all of their stars. But the <clears throat> big question is about the youth stepping up. They lost a lot of free agents. And, and you know, there, there's no doubt about it. Patrick Queen, Geno Stone, gone to division rivals, and others as well who have left for divisions such as Tyler Huntley in Cleveland, others. But the Ravens did improve their run game. And they've been one of the top rushing teams in the league really ever since the Lamar Jackson era started. And so people say, well, well, how can you improve that if they're already the best in the league? Well, Derrick Henry comes in, and obviously Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins were good when they were on the field for the Ravens, but Derrick Henry just brings you a whole different element as a running back, underrated speed. We know he's a power guy, and him and Lamar Jackson in the same backfield together, that's going to give opposing defenses nightmares. But the other question mark is on their offensive line. They lose three starters. A lot of youth coming in there. So Derrick Henry can't do it all by himself. Obviously, the offensive line has to block. <clears throat> and then on the defensive side of the ball, they're going to rely on a bunch of others as well. So obviously, a disappointing end for the Ravens in the AFC Championship game to Kansas City. Felt like that could have been the year. But they're, they're back to the drawing board. And, and hopefully, a division repeats in the cards for them this year. Do you have them, you predicting them as the number one team in the division <clears throat> this year? I am. I, I think that. It, it'll be close. I could definitely see the Ravens and another team from the division maybe having a tiebreaker scenario. But if I had to pick right now, look, there's no question about the Ravens regular season. It's about the playoffs. They're a solid regular season team. Once we get to the playoffs, we can have a different conversation. But I trust their record in the regular season to say that even though it'll be a harder path for them, I think they still have a good shot and I'll pick them to repeat this year. I want to ch switch to Jake from Locked On Bengals. Jake. Last year, the Bengals were the division champs coming into the season. They had injuries just derail their season with Joe Burrow, but he's back. He's ready. Is this the year that they take back the division? Well, they have a chance of doing so if Joe Burrow is healthy, and that is a question that we will continue to monitor with the Cincinnati Bengals as the season begins. The offense should be the Cincinnati Bengals offense. Tyler Boyd is out, but a complement of receivers will replace his role as a wide receiver three from Andre Yosevash to rookie Jermaine Burton with contributions from tight end Mike Gusecki in that wide receiver role. We all know Mike Gusecki is really a wide receiver, although I do think he'll line up more in line with the Bengals than he has previously in his career, for better or for worse. But the season will obviously hinge on Joe Burrow's health and ability to reach the levels that he's reached in the past, in addition to looking for veteran safeties, the return of Von Bell, and the addition of Geno Stone to solidify communication on the defensive end, where that was an abject disaster for the Bengals in 2023 that led to a lot of explosive plays. If those two things go right, there's no reason to think that with the soft schedule, the Bengals can't get back to the top of the division. Jeff, I want to switch to you on the Browns. The Browns finished second in the division. It was the, it was the first time since 2007 that they finished second in the division. Is this the year they get over the top and win the AFC North? I, you know, look, I, I've kind of put myself out there already that I think this probably could be the year. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, everybody talked about how well the Browns defense played last year. Um, for me, I think the thing that I'm really looking forward to this year is this is now year two of it all. Normally defenses don't come out of the gate that good 
you know, when you have so much newness, a new defensive coordinator, obviously a lot of new talent. Um, you know, they pretty much are running back the defensive line. Rookie Mike Hall was supposed to be a big part of things. Not sure when we're going to see him. Is he's now on the commissioner's exempt list? Um, you upgraded, in my opinion, at linebacker by bringing in Jordan Hicks. You know, the Anthony Walker, Sione Takitaki, they were nice names. But none of those guys had the actual football resume of a guy like Jordan Hicks at the linebacker position. Granted, the Browns don't want to play a, line, a lot of linebackers anyway. They want to get pass rushers on the field, and they want to get to nickel and dime as quickly as they can. Uh, they are legit three deep in corner, as we all know. Uh, safety, they are legit three deep there. So these teams that you know, move the ball by throwing it a lot, the Browns should be capable of taking care of that. Um, you know, offense, it, it's, it, it seems a little more promising today than it did maybe a week or two ago where we had no idea when either of the starting tackles or essentially who even the starting tackles are going to be. Um, for right now, it looks like Jack Conklin is sooner back than Jed Willis. It looks like that Jack Conklin is most likely going to be starting at left tackle. Um, Jed Willis could end up maybe the swing tackle here. Um, they really know what they have in Dewan Jones, and this also gives the Browns flexibility down the road where they're going to be able to save some money by having a starting tackle under contract for, you know, obviously relatively cheap. Um, the Nick Chubb, we know to this point, we won't see him in September, which is kind of what everybody anticipated. Um, the run game, look, this was never going to, it was always going to be a team that went more to Deshaun Watson anyway, due to the fact that the, you know, the investment that was made in Deshaun monetarily, this was going to become more his offense. One is necessarily Nick Chubb's, uh, last year that kind of got force fed and then it got force fed to where it wasn't Nick Chubb or Deshaun Watson's offense, but that's what it comes down to. You know, I mean, they're going to just have to be able to score, but I think the defense should be a more consistent than they were last year. Um, the defense didn't always travel as well last year on the road as well as they played at home. Um, but look, it, it, it's a really, really, really good roster. And it is really deep. Like, you know, when we had these roster break, I mean, the cuts today, it was like nothing was really surprising. You kind of knew who the Browns 53 man roster was going to be probably about four or five months ago. I hear you on that. Let's go quickly into over under projections brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the number one sports book in America. We start with the Ravens. Kevin, the Ravens are given 10 and a half as their over under mark. Are they going over or under year? I think they're going over. It's going to be a tougher path. They're playing a first place schedule. They have a really tough early season schedule too, where look again with that youth, it'll be a test and there'll be some growing pains. Zach Orr is the new defensive coordinator and what a test for him. First ever game play calling ever at any level mm -hmm. is against Kansas city in the NFL opener. So even though it'll be harder, I expect the Ravens to hover around anywhere from 11 to 13 wins. I put them in that 12 range, so I'm going over for Baltimore on that one. Jake, the Bengals have the same mark, 10 and a half wins. Do they go over this year? It's such a soft schedule for the Bengals. They benefit from the last play schedule despite finishing at 9 and 8 last year in those games against New England to start the season and Tennessee later in the season. Both look like pretty advantageous matchups, even if I think mm -hmm. Tennessee is improved on top of that. The division opponents for the entire AFC North don't strike me as terribly threatening this year. Of course, these things can change. But with that soft schedule and a really soft start to the season featuring New England, Washington, and Carolina, we've seen the Bengals dig themselves out of holes to beat this mark. This year, they should start out faster, and i like them to keep it together pending Joe Burrow's health. But I like the over, and I like it for the Ravens too, Kevin. I like it for the entire division, which I think is shaping up to be quite strong once again. Once again, the AFC North there. Jeff, the Browns at eight and a half after an 11 win season. Are they going over? Smash it. Smash yeah. it eight and a half. If I think this team is capable of winning. Look, I think every team in this division most likely is going to win nine games. So I, I think eight and a half is an unjust number probably to any team in this division. Um, the whole division as a whole, you know, even with Joe Burrow, you know, missing all that time. You know, everybody talked about how what the pressure was going to be for this division to, to hold up, you know, because we talked like it was the AFC West the year before. Everybody thought like that division was going to be. But it was it's a lot of pressure for four teams to truly be really good in the same NFL season. And you, you had that last year. Everybody was above 500, you know, stayed that way. But I mean, if, you know, if it's only eight and a half, obviously I think it's eight and a half. There's some teams you're facing earlier in the year that I think you would fit, rather face early than later. Washington being one of those teams, you would rather face them earlier, I think, before they start to find their groove later in the year. But yeah, I mean, eight and a half, you know, I have, I have a lot of confidence that eight and a half is an easy, easy number that I would wager to take the over for sure. The Steelers are at eight and a half as well. I'm smashing the over as well on that. The Steelers, as long as Mike Tomlin's been their coach, head coach, have not had a losing season. If they have eight wins, unless they tied one game, they have a losing season. I think they're at least getting nine wins, and uh, who knows, they might be even a little bit higher than that, even though they do have a brutal schedule. We'll get into more of that just here because we're just getting started. Coming up, what's the one thing that could derail the success of each season? It's the 2024 Locked On NFL Season Preview of the AFC North.
Passion, drive, and patience, that's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for, and with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. The 2024 Locked On NFL Season Previews continue. A reminder, you can get daily coverage of your favorite NFL team by subscribing to their Locked On podcast. We also have the NFL covered nationally with the Locked On NFL podcast, Locked On NFL Scouting, Peacock and Williamson, Locked On Fantasy Football, and Locked On Dynasty Football. And get 24-7 coverage of the NFL with our brand new Locked On NFL stream free on YouTube and Amazon Fire TVs. Now, we go to expectations for the team, for each team, and what can derail them. Kevin, you said they're over 10 and a half. Give it your expectation for the Ravens and the one thing that you think cannot happen to mess that up. I think this is a team that's going to be competing for a Super Bowl. My expectation for them is to at least get back to the AFC Championship. If not that, the season to me is a disappointment. And obviously there's a lot of talent in not only this division, but the AFC. And it's going to be tough for them to get there. Because especially with all the quarterback injuries we saw last season, particularly in the division with Joe Burrow, Deshaun Watson, etc. It's not going to be as easy for Baltimore And to me, the expectation should be that because, again, as I mentioned, we all all know the Ravens are a good regular season team, barring injuries, barring health. They are always consistent, especially in this John Harbaugh era. But nobody here in Baltimore really cares about that anymore because no one cares about regular season success if you cannot get the the job done in the playoffs and win the big game, which obviously Baltimore did not. Now, if there is a thing to derail the team, it would certainly be them going too far in on their youth movement while trying to compete for a Super Bowl. As I mentioned, those guys, they lost in free agency. A lot of vets out the door, guys who were stable veteran presences for that team last season. Now it's guys like Rashad Bateman stepping in into a full-time role who hasn't necessarily proven anything in his three seasons. You have rookies starting on the offensive line, second-year guys, other players who haven't proven a lot, replacing players like Kevin Zeitler, who's one of the most steady offensive linemen in this league still is a bit. So to me, I feel like they needed to go some way into this youth movement because it's just the way that these teams with these big quarterbacks on those big deals, that's how they have to go. But – their really only big signing of the offseason was Derrick Henry. Again, it's not like they lost Roquan Smith or Kyle Hamilton or anybody like that. But to me, this division is going to be the best in football. And if you're relying too much on youth and inexperience and that doesn't come to fruition, especially chemistry early in the season, it could come back to bite you later. So I think it's a huge risk reward for the Ravens. The risk is obviously there. But if enough guys step up, second year players, third year players, fourth year players could pay off for them in a big way. Jake, the Bengals had their season derailed with Joe Burrow's injury last year. Let's say Joe Burrow's healthy and ready to go this year. Is there another thing that you think is the big question mark that could get in the way of a Bengals comeback season? Yeah, that's the caveat is the Bengals season hinges on how Joe Burrow's wrist hinges. If he has full range of motion, the ability to grip the ball, then you're not really worried about that. But you're right. If something goes wrong there, well, all bets are off. Outside of Joe Burrow's status, which is the obvious answer, And it's also the correct answer. You don't need to talk too much about it, though, to your point. The next one would be, can the defense return to a a functional defense at the NFL level? They were getting gashed in the running game last year, especially when DJ Reader was off the field. DJ Reader no longer plays for the Cincinnati Bengals, so he will be off the field for the entire season. They need to be better against the run than they were without DJ Reader last year. The Bengals would have you believe that I mentioned this earlier, improved communication from the secondary down to the front four should help this quite a bit. The linebackers last year felt like they had more on their plate than they did with Jesse Bates and Von Bell roaming the secondary for the Bengals. And then they lost both of those guys. Von Bell's return has been talked up consistently by both the coaching staff and defensive players on the Cincinnati Bengals as to how much the communication has improved throughout the preseason. That could be a big difference, but... The question remains as to whether or not they can hold up on the ground against a run game without DJ Reader, without a real nose tackle on the team right now. McKinley Jackson, the rookie nose tackle, is injured at the moment. We'll see if he's ready for week one or not. 
And then there's a, a youth movement similar to what Kevin's talking about. Dax Hill making a transition from safety to starting at outside corner. He's been good this preseason and he won that job, but the Bengals are young in the secondary outside of that safety position. And they also had issues with explosive plays last year. So for looking for significant issues for the Bengals for once, I'm not talking about the offensive line. I actually feel okay there. I'm talking <laughs> about potential issues on the defensive side of the ball. Jeff, let's talk about the Browns' expectations after last year making the playoffs, getting 11 wins. What are the expectations this year, and what's the one thing that can't happen that get, get in the way of them? Well, I mean, the expectations should be high. I mean, you look at this roster, and it's weird. Like, I hear you guys talking about your rosters being young. Like, the Browns' roster is kind of like the veteran roster of the AFC North right now, which kind of sounds a little odd just to even say it the way it is. Um, you know, certainly, you know, their age, uh, overall age, certainly, you know, is, is on the, the latter part of the NFL spectrum. So the expectations should be extremely high. Um, certainly should be, you know, with the quarterback you have and what you paid to him, that is the expectation should be playoffs. It should be winning divisions, should be hosting playoff games. Um, there's two factors. Um, obviously, the biggest one, of course, is the same guy with a large contract to Sean Watson. Um, there's certain ways to look at this, you know. You know, and you don't want to ever use QB wins as a way to justify any quarterback who is on a big money contract. But Sean Watson is eight and four starting quarterback of the Cleveland Browns. It is what it is. Um, as sometimes it looked bad and he still won. Yes. As sometimes it looked better than people wanted to give it credit for. Yes. And we know why some of the reasons that probably does come and it's justifiably so. Um, but he really just has to take a step up here. Look, they doubled down. He's got five, if six, not wide receivers that could play at any given time between Cooper, between Judy, Cedric Tillman's really looks good. Elijah Moore was a nice presence last year. Um, you have rookie Jamari Thrash, David Bell. All these guys are produced at one point or another. You have David Ajoku finally putting it all together last year, becoming this all-around tight end that deserves to be mentioned with some of the top tight ends in the league. So it's on to Sean. And look, he doesn't have to go back to that magical final season that he played in Houston, you know, where it was just incredible numbers. Nobody else on the team really did anything. But he's got to do enough. And you, know, he can't be ever be the reason that the team loses a game. Certainly not. And the other thing is, it's you have three offensive tackles. Every one of them is coming back off of knee surgery. Jack Conklin today, it was his ACL, his MCL, uh, UCL, uh, tore some meniscus. I mean, like what else could you tear in your knee? So basically, you know, so for him to even say that in less than one calendar year, he's back at practice, most likely we're going to be ready to go for week one. Um, Jed Wills is not there yet. They say, you know, he's off the list. He's ready to go at any given time, just not there yet. Dewan Jones is also coming off of knee surgery. And you got to keep in mind, Last year was the most poor the Browns offensive line looked during the Baron Stefanski regime. It had always been the absolute staple and one of the first things you either talked about Miles Garrett or you talked about the Cleveland Browns offensive line. So when Bill Callahan left, it wasn't necessarily that it was, you know, what are you going to do? He's going to go work with his son. But it was also when they were coming off the worst run that they had had together as a group of the four years they were together. So if it was ever a time to maybe make a change, maybe it was the time. But we got no way of really evaluating that right now. Joe Batonio doesn't play in the preseason, nor should he. None of the tackles did anything in the pre preseason. So we have no idea. You have to think there's going to be some sort of learning, learning curve for this offensive line. It doesn't help that you know you don't have Nick Chubb for a minimum, you know, four weeks. Although Jerome Ford, you know, still gave you 1,200 total yards and nine touchdowns last year, which, you know, I think a lot of people just sleep on for some reason or another. Um, but that's really where it's going to come down to. It certainly comes down to Deshaun. And if it doesn't go well this year, obviously that's going to create a whole you know, weird circumstance for this team, which would finally have draft assets and would be able to, you know, fit, you know, get back into the game and try to correct something somewhere if they had to. But it comes down to Deshaun going out there and the Browns finally getting the Deshaun Watson or at least 85 percent of Deshaun Watson that they thought they were getting and this offensive line performing. Maybe not going to be as good as they were in their heyday, but getting back to being, you know, maybe not top five anymore, top 10, top 11, somewhere in that range. The Steelers, I think, are in a position where there's expectations for this team to get back to double digit wins. They had 10 wins last season. Um, the question is, can they do that and get a playoff win? That's what everyone's been desperate to see in Pittsburgh. I think the biggest thing that gets in the way of getting back there, because I do think this team is better as a roster. The, the thing is, they're playing a much tougher schedule this year. They've got the Eagles. They've got the Chiefs. They've got the Chiefs on Christmas Day. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be nothing. And then, of course, the whole AFC North gauntlet at the end of the season where everyone's playing each other, that's going to be where this division is won. I think the biggest thing that could get in the Steelers' way is what got in their way last year, and it's the injuries on defense. At one point, they were starting basically two practice 
squad linebackers, two practice squad safeties. Patrick Peterson was moving to safety at times. They were decimated with injuries last year, and that contributed to a, a three-game losing streak, including to the Patriots and Cardinals last year that derailed what was, at that point, a decent season. So the Steelers need to stay healthy. They, the good thing is they have depth on defense this year. They have they have Nick Herbig, at outside linebacker, and Marvin Leal switched out there, and he's been looking fine. So they're not as inept at behind T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith as they have been in past years. So I look at that, and I see there's better chances for that. But still, if this is a team that misses T.J. Watt for a big chunk of time, misses Mika Fitzpatrick for a big chunk of time, Patrick Queen for a big chunk, chunk of time. This could be a, another year where the Steelers defense isn't living up to the hype. I think the offense is as much as everyone wants to see it improve. As long as it's just beats the minimum that has been the last few years with Matt Canada, Kenny Pickett, Mitch Trubisky, name a quarterback. I think the Steelers will be happy with what they see on offense from Russell Wilson and company. But with that, we have to talk about MVP candidates real quickly. Kevin, is there any MVP candidate on this roster name, not named Lamar Jackson? And if not, what's the case for Lamar getting his third MVP? Yeah, I mean, I think that Lamar is your is your most obvious choice here. I guess as a dark horse, if you're not going to say Lamar Jackson, uh, Kyle Hamilton's obviously a Defensive Player of the Year candidate. But I mean, in a crazy world, maybe he goes out there and wins MVP, not putting any money on it. But uh, I, I would maybe say him. Maybe Derrick Henry shocks the world. Who knows? But obviously, for the Ravens, your your MVP candidate is Lamar Jackson. Jake, is it simple enough to say Joe Burrow or does Jamar Chase or someone else add into that conversation as far as MVP? The MVP is a quarterback award. There are two teams in this division that have a player that is likely yep. to win an MVP. We can talk about defensive player of the year candidates, offensive player of the year candidates, special teams player of the year candidates for some of these teams. There's good specialists in this division. But if we're talking about MVP, we're talking about quarterbacks, and that's obviously Burrow. Absolutely. Jeff, is there an MVP candidate on the Browns? Can Miles Garrett beat J what Jake just said? Well, I mean, you know, there are a couple of teams in this division, Chris, that have had a defensive player of the year on their defense. So they could be maybe mentioned as MVPs um, in Mr. Miles Garrett, uh, TJ Watt, of course. Um, you know, I mean, you know, if the Browns are going to go where they go, you know, I mean, if we're talking overall league MVP, I think the Browns will be viewed as a, you know, a varied team if they are successful. Do I think, you know, that would, you know, you know, we're also talking, you know, 45 touchdowns. I don't think Deshaun Watson is going to throw for 45 touchdowns. I don't think the Browns have any plans of trying to, you know, throw the ball like that that much. Not saying they may not or have to, um, you know, but, you know, it's it's the Browns are probably more of the overall parts become the greater sum. You know, I don't we're not going to mention Deshaun on the level of certainly, you know, Lamar or Joe Burrow. If there was to be an MVP from the AFC North, most likely it would be number nine or number eight. Yes. I, I look at the Steelers. Uh, I'm not saying Russell Wilson's going to be up in this conversation. I, I agree with Jake. TJ Watt has led the NFL in sacks in three out of the last four years, and he's not been in MVP conversations. He has gotten event, uh, a defensive player of the year once, finished second twice. But in all that, that, does, uh, that doesn't get you MVP. We got a lot more coming your way here with the grueling 18-week schedule. We're going to talk about what team, what the other, what we like about the other teams in the division. All that next here on the preview for the 2024 NFL season, focusing on the AFC North. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the number one sportsbook in America. And you've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. A reminder, here are the win total predictions for the AFC North. Both the Ravens and the Bengals currently sit with their over-unders at 10.5 wins, while both the Steelers and Browns sit with their over-unders at 8.5 wins. This is a division where all four teams last year finished with winning records. So this year, who will go over? Who will go under? Place your bets with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Also, we have something a little different for you today on America's number one sportsbook with FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5, and they'll get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then, with a YouTube TV-based plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. And that's FanDuel. 
The 2024 Locked On NFL Season Previews continue. A reminder, you can get daily coverage of your favorite NFL team by subscribing to their Locked On podcast. We also have the, the, the NFL covered nationally with Locked On NFL, Locked On NFL Scouting, Peacock and Williamson, Locked On Fantasy Football, and Locked On Dynasty Football. And get 24-7 coverage of the NFL with our brand new Locked On NFL stream, free YouTube and Amazon Fire TV. So let's play a game now. Each host, we're going to run through each of you. I want you to give flowers to a different team in the AFC North based off of something you would admire about that team is it the defensive scheme their education to the run game anything that's just not they have a good qb we start with kevin pick your afc north team to give some flowers to i'm gonna go and i've been very vocal about this i'm gonna go with cleveland and, and i'm gonna say and Jeff, good you, boy, know this, you, you know this that i've been very the, the sean watson trade not my favorite every other move for the most part, I've liked what Angie Barry has done in Cleveland. It seems like they have attacked a certain positional group every offseason. I think the defensive line was a big talking point over there for a couple of seasons. They obviously won all in on that. I think Andrew Barry, while it hasn't necessarily resulted in them winning a Super Bowl, I, I think it's been a nice change of direction for Cleveland. And again, while the quarterback move wasn't my favorite, I do think that getting in guys at other positions that can help round out this roster, obviously they're taking a chance on a guy like Jerry Judy and hoping that his career can kind of take off in Cleveland. But I've been very vocal. I think Andrew Berry's done a great job for the most part in Cleveland. And so I know it's it's hard to give flowers to your division rivals, but I, I got to give credit where it's due. I think Andrew Berry's done a great job. Jake, if you're giving credit to or flowers to one division team, what do you like about some team in the AFC North? Well, Kevin said it's hard to give praise to your division rivals. You would have to really hold my feet to the fire to get me to say anything nice about the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> I could if I had to, but I don't want to, so I won't. <laughs> but uh, I'll echo Kevin's <laughs> praise for the Cleveland front office, but uh, that's not where I'll focus my time. I just think that Cleveland does a good job of spending money, and they spend money in a way that NFL teams don't. I respect their – gumption to go for it and really spend money to make that happen and i could talk about the defenses for all of these teams but then i would have to talk about the pittsburgh steelers so let's talk about the baltimore ravens and <laughs> their consistent attempt to make ravens football win and the ability to do it and by ravens football i'm talking about constructing that offense around Lamar Jackson and running the ball. And they found some receivers for him this year. We'll see if that transforms them a little bit and helps them modernize them under Todd Munkin, who I think is a good offensive coordinator. But while I downplay the importance of running back routinely, I maybe can't quite do that when it's Derrick Henry. And so I will give flowers to the pairing of Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson. If that works out and Derrick Henry still has tread on the tires like we think he does, that could indeed be a significant factor for the AFC North to deal with this year. Jeff, your flowers in the AFC North. I'm assuming people have listened to some of our shows from years past, and that's why they put this segment in. And I'll, I'll just spread it out. Look, Mike Tomlin is a ridiculously good NFL football coach. There is no way around it. Um, the Bengals for, you know, whatever everybody tries to make. And look, we, all, we don't know truly what the finances are, but for where they are right now, and the roster that they have. And, you know, there's going to be some probably moving on from a guy or two, and maybe T Higgins isn't going to be here any longer, but trying to already cover that up, um, you know, with the young Princeton kid, you know, with Jermaine Benton, uh, Jermaine Burton, trying to make sure that they can keep this thing going over the next couple of years as, you know, they make a big investment in Jamar Chase, which is rightfully so, um, you know, trying to keep this thing sustainable. And the Ravens, I, I kind of actually echo Jake's point, because every seems every year when we talk about this is, well, did they get it right around Lamar? And then every year we would just see Lamar and Mark Andrews light it up all season long, and they overcame whatever they didn't do. Zay Flowers looks like it's he's finally it's finally that guy, you know, where they're going to even get to talking about a second contract to have a wide receiver play with Lamar Jackson. I'm not sure how the Derrick Henry thing is going to work out because it's money you put to it where they were never paying money to the running back anyway, and they were getting really great production from the running game. So it's interesting, you know, I mean, they kind of zagged here where, you know, normally they were digging that type of thing. But, you know, everybody, look, I mean, everybody's good in this division. So, yeah, it bites our tongue. Nobody wants to talk about it. But there are certainly positives within every franchise in this division currently. That's why this division is where it's at right now. Everyone is good in this division. 
I'll say that, and that means I obliquely said something nice about the Pittsburgh Steelers. And you didn't have well, – but now you actually said Pittsburgh, but go ahead. There you, there you go. But I, I'll say if I'm giving flowers, I love how the Ravens have assembled talent around Lamar Jackson in the offense at the playmaker position, adding Derrick Henry, Zay Flowers developing into another into another year. I love Zay Flowers in college. Got to cover him in the ACC. I, and with Mark Andrews, I liked what they did with Isaiah Likely last year. I think that Lamar Jackson has been asked to just carry the playmaking on that offense but on his back – for too long and now with more weapons he doesn't have to do that as much and that can allow him to play within a scheme and i think that can that could do a lot for the ravens we got we still got a few more things to cover cover here though uh which rookies make a difference in the season give me one rookie that that that, that needs to be talked talked about kevin you start with the ravens for the Ravens, I, I do think it is Nate Wiggins. Baltimore loves running different corner rotations. Obviously, they love his speed, sub four three guy. And in an offensive system, an offensive world where you're seeing a lot of teams, for example, them going up against the Chiefs in week one, they add Xavier Worthy in that speed element. Wiggins can trail those guys. If he gets beat, he can catch up to those players as well. He's a good cover corner. A little concern about the frame, definitely. I think he needs to add a little more weight in order to be sustainable over the course of his career. But I think that is something they're going to work on during the offseason. For now, it's kind of like you have what you have and you're going to work with it. But Wiggins is a player that can slot in with Marlon Humphrey and Brandon Stevens in a really quality three-cornerback rotation on the outside. You can move some of these guys inside as well while they're waiting for some other corners to heal up. But Nate Wiggins, I expect to have a pretty good rookie season in Baltimore, especially because they invested a high draft pick in him and Baltimore loves investing in their secondary. They did it again here. Jake, give me a rookie on the Bengals to be on the lookout for. How many? Six, seven, six, eight, maybe. 340 pound. Run a five second, 40 yard dash. Put up a nine foot broad jump with 36 inch arm tackles have been on the Cincinnati Bengals lately. Them dogs. Zero. Amarius Mims is a freak of nature in the best possible way, and the mentality matches the physical traits. If he gets on the field, and we expect him to get onto the field early into the season, I'm excited for that kid's future, bringing a level of talent and physical ability that the Bengals have not had on the offensive line in the Joe Burrow era. Jeff, give me a Browns rookie to be on the watch out for. Well, obviously, I can't bring up Mike Hall because I don't know exactly when Mike Hall is going to be seen again. Um, right. But I think Zach Zinter was probably a really, really quiet quality draft choice. But this also what happens when you get hurt so late in the season like he did in the Ohio State game, wasn't a part of the playoffs, did nothing during the draft process. Plus, he's a guard. It's like what, that is if you're injured as a guard in the draft press, this is a really way to get easy way to get overlooked, you know, because everybody during the draft process is looking for tackles or we're kicking tackles inside. And then all of a sudden they drop two, three rounds. Um, but Zach Zinter is already the backup left guard. He's the backup right guard. Um, so, you know, Joe Batonio, he's not getting any younger, obviously great player, fantastic career for the Cleveland Browns. You know, Wyatt Teller, you know, there's been times where he's been dinged up late in the season. So, you know, as far as a rookie that could see significant playing time, granted, some, a door would have to open for any rookie for the Browns to see significant playing time. It could be Zach Zinter. But as to the point I was making earlier with Tawan Jones, as the Browns start spending more money elsewhere, you can start maybe starting to get that offensive line a little bit cheaper where you have Dewan Jones on a rookie contract. Zach Zinter could be a starting guard for this team full-time as early as 2025. They'll make some money, save some money there. He would definitely be, you know, the one, and it would be key, obviously, because it is protecting, obviously, the overall $236 million investment. The Steelers rookie I'm picking is Zach Frazier, the rookie center out of West Virginia. He's a physical dominant leverage winning center in the middle in the middle part of the field. You saw it on the on their touchdown run in their last preseason game when he opened up a hole for Cordero Patterson to scamper for 31 yards up the middle. He's going to be doing a lot of the things that the Steelers have been missing at the center position, which is a strong, sturdy player at the middle who can handle defensive tackles in, in the gap, move them out of the way, chip to the second level, use this athleticism. I think Zach Frazier makes a world of difference both for the run game and in pass protection up the middle where the Steelers have also struggled in recent years all right here we go the big finish here real quick guys kevin give me your breakdown of division first second third fourth where does everyone finish i think the ravens and bengals tie for first with the ravens winning with division tiebreaker head to head what one of those tiebreakers i think that joe burrow again as jake said health health presumed with, with this answer, I think that they will tie record wise. I have them both at around 12 wins. So right in that range, I think that Pittsburgh just needed something at quarterback. And I think Cleveland needed an upgrade. I have those two tied for third 
with uh, Pittsburgh coming out in the head-to-head, so I have them right around 10 wins each. I think that Cleveland finishes fourth in a in a just a, a sliver behind everyone. To me, I mean, it's it's about believing in Deshaun Watson. I have to see it first to believe it with him. Jake, give me your division finish finish rankings here as you predict them. I'll take the Bengals on the strength of that last play schedule I mentioned earlier. I'll take the Ravens. I'll take the Browns. I'll take the Steelers because I do not believe in Russell Wilson more than I don't believe. It, well. I guess I believe in the Browns defense a little bit more. I don't know. The the Steelers and Browns are annoying, indistinguishable teams from one another to me that both have really good defenses and huge question marks at quarterback. Jeff, give me your division rankings and how you see them finishing. I guess defense doesn't matter anymore in the NFL. Um, well, I think the Cleveland Browns are going to finish one overall. I think the Baltimore Ravens are going to finish second. I think the Bengals are trending right back up to where they were. I think they're probably just going to be uh, just one more offseason away on defensive players. I think that's just going to be the key for the Bengals. It's just, you know, as they're going to lose, you know, T Higgins and maybe some money there, it's going to be probably getting somebody to solidify that defensive line. So hopefully, you know, when they get to some of these games later in the season, they don't struggle against the run. Um, Chris, I, I think the thing for you, and look, they, they may not get to less than 500, but I think Pittsburgh needs to find what is the next decade. Look, I mean, this team has had a long run of longtime quarterbacks. And even if Russ was good, how much like it's not going to be a sustainable thing. Like I think Pittsburgh, who's you know, and they made a lot of good moves. Who's going to be that quarterback? You know, for the next you know decade of Mike Tomlin's era, there. I, I just you know, like the the Russ Wilson and you know Jeff Fields. I mean, look, they're better names than Kenny Pickett, and I know that's a whole difficult situation for you, obviously. Um, but you know, I, I'm not sure if it's you know anybody's just going to come in and just wow. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I mean. The, the passing game outside of Pickens just seems, you know, you definitely have some questions about that. Obviously, that was probably their rumored interest and in why they were so desired to. And wait a minute, he still has meant to Brandon Ayuk. But, you know, maybe just one more, you know, receiver in there as well. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't two, three, four the way I dropped it. Yeah. Let it be known that this is the sixth straight season we've done this. And Jeff Lloyd has picked the Steelers to finish last in every single time that we've done this. And it has not happened since 1989. Joe Burrow's wrist would have said otherwise last year. (laughs) Sure. Uh, But anyway, (laughs) the Steelers aren't finishing in first this year, but I don't think they're finishing in last. In fact, I think they could be finished right around tied for second. I think the Ravens win the division this year. The Steelers and the Bengals battle it out. I think the Browns, like like Kevin said, kind of either a game, half a game tiebreaker right behind uh, the, the Steelers and the Bengals this year. I think that the, uh, Russell Wilson, I don't think he's as uh, he's going to be as leaned upon as the other teams are going to need their quarterback. This is still going to be a team that wants to run the ball, use play action, be smart, and play great defense. And I think this defense got significantly better with the way that things are looking into the offseason compared to what they were dealing with last season. So I have the Steelers finishing in a tie with second and third, say that they'll get a tiebreaker over, over the Bengals to finish second. The Ravens win the division again. The Browns fin- finish last this season. But like everyone's saying, this is going to be the best division in football. It's going to be a tight race down the wire, and it's going to be really fun because we'll get hard knocks detailing the whole way through as all the teams play them play each other in the final eight weeks of the season, and it's going to be a lot of excitement. Thank you to to all of you for joining joining me here on the AFC North preview. And thank you all for listening to the 2024 Locked On NFL season preview with the AFC North. If you want to hear how the other divisions will play out this year, subscribe to Locked On NFL wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.